Hey you guys, welcome to another Coffee Talks. I have tea today. <laughs> um, today I want to talk about self-compassion. Um, as I put it down because I have to talk. <laughs> I want to talk about self-compassion. Uh, I'm in a, a level two nutritional course that's a lot about... Um, the first nutrition course I did was very science focused and this one is like very coaching behaviors and like kind of mind stuff, um, science and stuff like that. Um, and we did this whole unit on self-compassion. And, and when it first, when I first saw it, I was thinking like, oh, come on, like fluffy self-compassion. Like I believe in it, but, um, I don't know if I necessarily wanted to learn about it in a nutrition course, but I ended up walking away with so much value and something that I wanted to share, um, is this really, really interesting study that was done. And this sums it up for me. This sums up why self-compassion is so, so vital. Okay. So the study that was shared for me in my precision nutrition level two fitness um, nutrition course is, so these researchers, they took two groups of women, they took a group of women and divided them into two groups, group A and group B. And they told the women that they were doing a study on um, like watching TV and eating habits, like, you know, eating in front of the TV. So they gave every woman a room with a comfy couch, a TV, and they gave them a donut and they were told to eat the donut. And at the end of this portion of the study, because it was in two parts, at the end of this portion, one of the groups, group A, was told by the researchers before moving on to part two, they were told, look, we have a lot of people that come in here that feel bad about like eating the donut. We really don't think you need to feel bad about it. Um, everybody eats this stuff. Everybody that comes in here has to eat the donut. It's a drop in the bucket compared to everything else you eat in the day. And there's really no reason to beat yourself up about it or feel bad. Okay. So basically given permission to have some compassion for themselves, right? And group B was told nothing. They still all ate the donut. Um, the second part of the study involved these same women now going through a candy taste test, which is what they were told the study was going to be, um, where they go into a room and they have multiple candies and they were told to taste each and have as much as they wanted of all of them, okay? And this is where it gets super interesting. So clearly lots of people, women especially, tend to be on diets, whether they are um, like rigid kind of actual diets like that have a name like keto or um, the zone or whatever it is, or they are overall in a dieting mentality where they're reducing their intake, okay? Um, so about half of these women self-reported that they were currently dieting. And what they found was that the women in group B who were not given permission to feel self-compassion um, out of for after eating the donut, overall ate more candy than the women in group A. This is the most important, important and interesting part is that the women who self-reported that they were dieting not only ate more candy overall, but the women in group B who had self-reported that they were dieting are the ones that ate the most candy of all of the of all of the women. Okay, so literally. The women who were intentionally dieting, number one, the fact that they were intentionally dieting and ate more than the people who weren't uh, um, intentionally dieting, but the women in that specific group who were intentionally dieting, who weren't given that self-compassion, the permission to have self-compassion, ate the most candy of everyone. And this shows two things. The point of the study was to show that self-compassion matters. Um, and it seems logical. You know that a donut's not a big deal. You know this logically, right? I know this logically. But our subconscious, we've been practicing something different for so long. We've been practicing restriction. We've been practicing good foods, quote unquote, and bad foods, quote unquote, right? We've been practicing these things um, for so long that there's that inherent kind of language that happens in our minds without even us necessarily realizing it's happening. And when somebody outside of your brain, like these researchers, tell you, hey, remember, you're smart, you know this donut's not a big deal, don't let it ruin your day, it doesn't matter, just eat it, enjoy it, and move on, you're kind of like, okay, and you're more able to do that, to tell that to your conscious mind, right? These women in group B were not dumb, they know the same things as you and me about the insignificance of a donut, but their subconscious was kind of taking over in this, in this moment, thinking that it was, you know, bad and beating themselves up, and what that leads to is overeating, okay? When you're not giving yourself the space to understand that it's not a big deal and to have some compassion for yourself, 
then you're more likely to go into a situation with an abundance of food and be a little bit more logical about it. Um, and there's this woman, Katie Nuff, you've probably heard of her. I, every time I mention her to somebody, like, oh yeah, I don't know. I didn't hear about her until this course. But she's like this, I think she works at UT Austin and she's like a psychiatrist, psychiatrics, whatever. She works in this stuff. And she kind of coined this definition for self-compassion. And I know that there was three parts. I can't remember one of them, but I know one was kindness. One of them was, this is the one that I identify with the most, was this idea of a common sense of humanity. Okay, so self-compassion does not mean um, bubbly positivity and optimism all the time. It does not mean stuffing down your feelings in order to remain optimist and optimistic and positive and everything's okay. That's not what self-compassion means. Self-compassion is, to me, the idea that how would you talk to your best friend? If your best friend was juggling everything that you juggle in your life, maybe kids, a, a job, um, maybe homeschooling, maybe, you know, COVID, <laughs> a worldwide pandemic, um, everything that you have going on in your life. If your best friend was juggling all of those things while also trying to maintain a weight or had some kind of fitness or aesthetic goals and your best friend enjoyed a donut, what would you say to her or him? you probably wouldn't say the same things to him or her that you would say to yourself. Am I right? I mean, it's the idea like you're seeing this person from this third party perspective and this bird's eye view. And you're saying it's not a big deal. Like that donut, it means nothing in the span of everything. That's the same way that you need to see yourself. And when you can get there um, and have that same self-compassion that you, the same kind of compassion that you might have for somebody else or your best friend, um, it, it kind of changes everything. It really changes everything. It changes your perspective going into so many situations. Okay. So that's the first, that's the main piece of that this study, um, that this study like was showing and that I got out of it. But the other thing, and this ties into something else I was learning about in my course is this idea of, um, cognitive restriction, cognitive calorie restriction. Now, the reason I say cognitive calorie restriction is because there's a difference between cognitive calorie restriction and actual calorie restriction. Um, and this blew my mind too, because again, I kind of know this, but when you put it in terms like this, cognitive calorie restriction versus calorie restriction, it's like, okay. So actual calorie restriction is doing something in your daily life to um, lessen the amount of food that you're eating, right? I mean, whether that's following a diet with set rules or whether it's tracking your macros and calories to make sure that you're coming in less than what your body's burning, Whatever it may be, that's what that is. There's also cognitive calorie restriction, and that is the mental game, so to speak, of restricting your intake. And sometimes these two overlap. Uh, many times they do. Um, I currently track my macros and I'm trying to eat at a deficit. Um, and so I am practicing cognitive calorie restriction because I'm thinking about it, but I'm also actually doing it. And so they are interlining. Um, the, the tricky game to play is making sure the cognitive doesn't take over. So a lot of times what will happen is people are either dieting and they're actually restri restricting calories, but their cognitive um, blows it out of proportion a little bit and they get into this restrictive mindset. Or what will happen is the person isn't actually even trying to diet. They're not following any particular protocol, but they still have this mindset of cognitive restriction. And what happens in both of these scenarios is that you're being so restrictive in your mind that you end up not actually, actually in real life restricting anything because you're able to hold up that front um, most of the time maybe, and most of these times are when you are in front of people. So in social situations, whether you're at work, even sitting at home having dinner with your spouse or your partner or whoever you live with, um, but when you're alone and nobody's watching, that's when those restrictive barriers fall. And that's when the over intake of calories happen. And it ends up leading to not actually restricting in real life your calories at all, because your cognitive restriction is it, it's too much. It's too restrictive. OK. Um, and so when this study, it's really interesting because clearly the women who were dieting had a level of cognitive restriction also. Um, but when they, the women in group B who weren't given that permission to feel self-compassionate, they, it seems like probably almost all of them had some level of cognitive restriction also. Um, and group A who were given permission to feel self-compassion, that helps eliminate a little bit of that cognitive restriction, which actually had them eating less. 
So when you are so cognitively restricting yourself, your cortisol levels are up. You can't stop thinking about food. Um, hormones are out of whack. And there's a lot going on in your body. Your brain controls so much in your body, okay, that it actually impacts it. So when you combine cognitive restriction with a lack of self-compassion, you have a recipe for overeating, over overindulging, um, and constantly being in a state of stress um, and frustration and pretty much ensuring that you're not going to make progress, okay? And this to me is mind-blowing because it really is about the mind. It really is about the mind. You have so many coaches, so many trainers um, hammering away at exercises and diet, and you have so many individuals who are not trainers or coaches or nutritionists, but coming to trainers and nutritionists and coaches looking for nutrition, looking for training. And so many people ignore the mindset and the mind is the biggest one. I would argue the biggest one. If you can't get that piece in line, then none of the other stuff matters because it's not going to happen, right? It's not going to, it's not going to stay consistent. Um, and so that, I mean, now we're just like, I'm going into, um, this whole idea of strength for me and the Venn diagram that you might have you might have seen before is that mental, emotional, and physical, and that intertwining of all three, and that spot right in the middle is really where you discover that true strength because you cannot ignore the mindset. Um, and so self-compassion, guys, it is so vital. It's not just a fluffy term to make you feel good. It is not. And if it, it, it can be, if that helps you, um, I tend to steer away from fluffy things because I'm like, eh, well, fluffy equals non-valid. No, this is science. Okay, this is science. You have to have some self-compassion. You have to look at yourself and everybody else around you and have a common sense of humanity. You have to eat that donut because it's delicious and you love it. And you also have to just move on after because you literally will not make progress towards any of your goals, whether mental, physical, aesthetic, nutrition-wise, if you can't get that piece down. Okay? I'm having a sip of my tea. This, by the way, is strawberry cheesecake. Um, I've only ever found it here in Germany. I wish I could like let you smell this because it literally smells like strawberry cheesecake. Not like strawberry, but there's a smell of like the cheese, the creaminess in it. It's insane. I, I wish I wish I could transmit smell. Maybe that's in the future. But anyway, self compassion, cognitive restriction. Um, please think about that this week and for the next weeks to follow and check in with your conscious mind because your subconscious mind and your conscious mind are very different, okay? You might know in your conscious mind about self-compassion and all of this makes sense, but check it in with your subconscious mind because your subconscious mind and is what does, um, let, me, let me talk for five more minutes because I just thought of something. Your subconscious mind is where everything that you've been practicing that you're really, really good at now, maybe it's talk, negative self-talk, maybe it's um, catching all of the areas in your body that you hate. Maybe it's seeing that donut and telling yourself you shouldn't quote unquote, or, or, or can't quote unquote, I hate those words. That'll be in another coffee talk. Um, eat, eat it. Okay. It's the things that you've practiced. And just because you're really good at it and just because it comes naturally does not mean it's the right thing. Okay. Do you hear that? Just because you're good at it, just because it comes naturally does not mean it's the right thing. It's because that's what you've practiced. And because you've practiced it so long, you've gotten really, really good at it. You've gotten so good at it that your conscious mind doesn't even pick it up anymore. It just happens. It happens without you even being aware. It happens when you have a smile on your face and you're walking down the street on a sunny day. Nobody else would see it because it's, it's just happening in the back of your mind. Am I right? Okay. So you have to practice something new. You want to get better at having self-compassion. It's going to have, it's going to take work. Okay, it's going to take work because it's conflicting with what you've always practiced, which is really not self-compassion, actually. Um, you might think you can have compassion in yourself, in your conscious mind, but again, what is your subconscious mind telling you? What's that little voice in the back of your mind telling you? You need to get those aligned, and it takes practice, and it's not always going to be perfect. Um, sometimes the things you practice are so hammered in, they literally will never go away. Mine hasn't gone away by any means, but you get better at uh, placing a second voice there. So that one doesn't go away, but you can put another one there that can kind of talk it down, right? Um, so that's what we're going to be practicing. We're going to be practicing the self-compassion. We're going to practice not being so cognitively restrictive. Okay, you need to be 
Just as I say 80-20 with nutrition and fitness, you have to have 80-20 balance, 80% accuracy, not 100. Aim for 80. You need to do the same cognitively. You need to aim for 80%, okay? Not 100, because that's, it's too much, it's unsustainable for anybody. And so if you aim for that, you're never gonna reach it and you're doomed to never, to constantly spin your, spin your wheels, okay? So, um, what was I talking about? Oh, the conscious and the subconscious and the practicing, right. So practice something new. Take the next couple of weeks to practice something new. And remember that any new skill, any new skill takes time to learn. You don't just try it and it's hard and you give up, okay? You keep trying. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes until it starts to become a little bit more second nature, until you can get that little second voice in your subconscious that can talk down that first one who probably will never go away, but you can learn to manage it, okay? So that's what I got for you today. Self-compassion, cognitive restriction. See you next time.